please remain standing as we read God's word together. Uh, same section we have been in. We are in Matthew chapter 16. And we're looking at verses 16 through 18. Matthew 16, verses 16 through 18. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit is preaching to all of our hearts here today. And the truth of your word be proclaimed here. May we be edified and renewed. May we be brought to conviction and repentance. And may we glorify your son as uh, we dwell on this important subject matter, uh, the, the, the body that you have built. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're still on our study of the church and we're going to have this important stance, uh, the same thing that I've been repeating every week. It's very important. This important emphasis that I've been having here is that uh, the church is Christ built, therefore it is Christ owned. And I will repeat that every week while we are on this subject. The church is Christ built, therefore it is Christ owned. This is something that I cannot stress enough. This is something that we shall not stress enough. Last week, we looked at the offices of the church, and this week, we, we were going, we're going to look at the government of the church, as the offices of the church and the government of the church go together. And we are reflecting on those words from our Lord, that, uh, that he will build his church. And so we are slowing down and taking a serious study on what is the church. It is, it is important for the church to know who they are, what they are, and what we are doing. And some of the things that I just mentioned are things that I have alluded to throughout this series. We've alluded to the governing models. We've kind of kind of teased that a little bit. And so today we are going to be honing in on the church government and kind of bring that together with the offices look like last week with uh, how the church is supposed to be governed. Now, the history of the church in America is 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 fascinating, but it's also quite odd. In the early days before the time of the Revolutionary War, uh, before the time of the Declaration of Independence, Christianity in America, for the most part, was Puritan. It was Puritan theology. Now, myself, in my opinion, I consider the Puritans the height of what Christianity in real time looks like, or what it should look like. It is a moment in history where I kind of look back and although there were many obstacles they faced and, uh, and although they had many battles, it wasn't like they didn't have their issues, their, their obstacles. It wasn't like they didn't have any problems. They had all of that, if not more. I mean, a lot of those guys had to fight off vitamin C deficiencies because there just wasn't enough when they first came over. That's something we don't typically buy. I mean, uh, have to battle anymore. We're talking about health issues. We're talking about environmental issues. I have an ancestor struck by lightning protecting his own family during this time. And so, um, I mean, there was just many different things that we take for granted today that we don't consider what others went through. And so they went through a lot. I mean, they were building a nation. You know, like like they were they were building. And so, I mean, there was a lot going on. But the strength of God's true church, in my opinion, was best displayed at the time of the Puritans. Now, I, you heard me use the phrase Puritan theology. I'm using this phrase Puritan theology. And although Puritan theology is Reformed theology, it wasn't the same as the Reformers. It was expanded on a bit more. It was, it was, it, they went into the finer details more than the Reformers did. And there's, there's a lot of history behind that. Uh, you know, the, re, the Reformers couldn't figure out everything of everything in their time. They were still fa battling their own cultures, what was going on in their days. And so, I mean, there's just so much you can do. But um, while the, they were influenced by the works of Calvin and, and Luther and John Knox and so many others, the Puritans was kind of like the fruit of, of the Reformation, if I can use that phrase. They were able to take what the Reformers had started and they began to polish it. It was something 
nicer, something better, something more systematic at times. Of course, this is just my opinion of it. Some people may point to a different point in history and say they believe this is a better time for the church and a better picture of Christianity. Some would say uh, the early church would be that example. And I got no arguments with that. As a matter of fact, I believe that the, the Reformation leading to the, the Puritan theology was really a repeat of history. It was really a repeat of like the early church. And likewise, the early church had many of their own obstacles that they had to face, worse obstacles than, than the church has ever faced, in my opinion, on that matter as well. I mean, they had the persecution of Nero at one point and, and of many uh, Roman leaders, but they still grew in strength and they still grew in numbers. But we're talking about Christianity in America. And we don't have the time to cover every little bit of, of history, so I will be painting very broad strokes here. It was through the Puritans where we have our sense of education and our sense of freedom. It was through the Puritans. Uh, and it was for the idea for a better culture. However, we taken, we taken what was good and what was this glorious vision of the Puritans and uh, we turned it into something secular. We took in what was good and glorious with what, what they envisioned for this nation and we went and perverted it. What we call, what we call the the. the the founding fathers of America really just kind of ripped off the ideas from the Puritans. Uh, it wasn't their ideas. It wasn't, it wasn't something new for them. So much of what they were a part of was ripping off what the Puritans started a hundred years before them. They were just taking the ideas that they were hearing from other preachers and other, other churches in that area. It was all coming from a Puritan theology. I mean, our whole public education system was the idea that came from the Puritans. Not like how, not like how we see it today. Not at all. No way. But the idea was a community gathering together to actually educate their children, to make sure that their children were able to read and write for themselves so they may be able to discern what is right and what was wrong. The idea behind the Puritans is that they wanted to give their children all the tools they can give them uh, so they may never be persuaded by Rome again. That was the real reason. They didn't want them to be persuaded by the lies that were coming from the Roman Catholic Church. Because in that time, the Roman Catholic Church was saying, you don't have the right to read the Bible. We will read it to you and interpret it for you. And so they wanted to equip their children with the ability to read and write so they may be able to discern and not fall victim to falsehood. This not only equipped them to take a stand against Roman Catholicism, it, it equips them to take a stand against any form of heresy. So the idea of public education comes from the idea of defending the truth of God's word. That's where it comes from. We would have no clue about this in the modern day public education system at all. It's not the... Same thing. And it's not to say that everything was perfect with the Puritans as well. They, they made mistakes. This is true of all of us in here. This will be true of everyone after us as well. And this will be true of all ministries. Puritanism began to grow dry, though, for whatever reason. Uh, it could be... Because of the pastors, it could be people were just being uh, sick of the demands. Who knows exactly why it began, began to grow dull in America, but it did. And so things became, it became a time that was ripe for revival. And revival did come, and historians call this the Great Awakening. Now the interesting thing is that the Great Awakening was still deep in Puritan theology. It never separated from that Puritan theology. But it was followed with a great zeal, and that was the huge difference. difference. It came with this great zeal. And that was, that, that was, I guess, what was lost in the American culture. They wanted to know where the zeal was. And here comes someone like Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield, and they have this zeal and this passion and this power in preaching. And they came with this, this energy, and they came with compassion, but they came with truth as well. And it was an intensity, and nobody was really familiar with this intensity, so it was new, and people were drawn to it. But what people forget about the Great Awakening is that within Jonathan Edwards' own lifetime, people began to reject him. He's like kind of preserved in history now with many pastors. Like, here's this great American theologian, and some do consider him to be the greatest American theologian. 
But before his life ended, he was mostly rejected by, by the people that used to claim they loved him, and he was chased out of many churches. So by the end of his life, this sensation that they all experienced during the Great Awakening was disappearing, and they no longer wanted the one who was teaching this stuff. And then sometime after he died, tension began to grow with England. The Revolutionary War was not just some event that just happened to start it. It, it. it was something that was growing over many years. Tension was growing over many, many years. And everything that was coming from England, it began to just be a, be a knife to the spine for so many people. And one of the, you know what, one of the big, the big, uh, you know, the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was that they raised the taxes on tea. That was one of them, one of the final straws for a lot of people in, 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 uh, in the colonies of America when, when they raised the taxes on tea, when England raised the taxes. I mean, you got to understand, they were still Englishmen for the most part. I mean, they were still connected to England. And to an Englishman, his tea was important. It was very important, especially during this time. So England, trying to get more money out of the colonies in America, they did this by, I mean, they did a lot of things that drove them nuts. It wasn't just this, but when they began to, when they began taxing the tea, that, that, that's when they were like, nope, you don't mess with tea. That's what the Americans did. I mean, today, <laughs> today the government's like, we're going to raise taxes on you guys. And we're like, for what? And they're like, because we hate you. I, they don't really say it like that, but... They go, uh, we're going to raise taxes. We go, for what? Because we hate you. And we're all like, okay. And, and, and we kind of let them take all these taxes. And it, uh, we're, we're being ripped off with taxes. But back then, they raised the taxes on tea. And the people are like, you got a death wish? You want to die? What, what's going on here? You think you could do this to us? And, and that was like that breaking point. I mean, just consider how much taxes we pay now versus then. And it was just taxes on tea where there's like, no. Nah. You, you've crossed a line now. Kind of seems like we lost our spine, doesn't it? So the war breaks out, and there was many other things. There was, there was uh, accusations that uh, British soldiers uh, uh, beat up a young boy, and that's uh, like if you guys know the, the story of Samuel Adams and whatnot, and him uh, uh, leading some people, and they, they fought back, and it was, it was this huge thing. And people, people question if a boy was actually beat up or if they just used that to manipulate a battle. And There's all kinds of history there, but the war breaks out. America now wants to be an independent nation, so they do the Declaration of Independence. We are no longer going to serve you guys. We're not going to serve King George anymore or the throne there in England. And so it became a time where, in America, the land was forced to live off their own resources, and they had to develop their own resources. And this included exploring parts of the land that has never been explored yet. I mean, there was so much of this nation that has yet, hasn't been seen by these people and they're declaring their independence without knowing what the full scope of the land is yet. And so now it's time to, to thrive on your own and live on your own resources. And this means from the late 1700s into the 1800s, America was busy. Like the, the, the people of America were very busy. Different types of farming, different types of ranching. You had different types of mining taking place. And eventually the, the development of the railroad and that took a lot of work. I mean, the amount of work that was going into these things was intense, and it required labors from both uh, slaves and, and free. And slaves of all kinds. It wasn't just African descent in slavery. We had Asian slaves. We had Irish slaves. Nobody remembers the Irish slaves, by the way. That's gone in history. But uh, uh, it was there. Meanwhile, back in Europe, everything is already established there. And so they didn't have to work as hard for their development. You know, they still worked at developing, but they didn't have to work nearly as hard as America did. They weren't trying to build a nation. Their nation was built. So on the European side, they focused on studies and education. And they, that, that's where they weren't focused on building a nation. It was all about studies and education. Then they began, we began this to enter into what we call the Enlightenment era. 
and the teachings of Europe were having a great influence on the minds in America. Because the minds in America were too busy and too wrapped up in uh, this type of thinking and work and building a nation. So the academic minds that were around in America were being influenced by the academic minds that were over there in Europe. And so in the 1800s, we began to slowly lose our educational system to what was being taught in Europe. Like you have to remember, Yale was a theological school. It was a seminary. Jonathan Edwards, the one I just talked about, was the first president of Yale. It wasn't just some prestigious college to get a fancy education. It was theological training. And as they began to be influenced by what the Europeans were teaching, they be that began to disappear. Just like it was disappearing from Oxford. And then with all the expansion that was going on, you had what was called the circuit rider preachers. That was a big form of preaching back in the 1800s. These preachers would get on horseback and travel from small town to small town to preach the gospel. Because there were a lot of small towns that didn't have churches. And so they had what was called the circuit riders. And they just kept moving. They kept going on. And then what we, we have what history is called the second great awakening. And the Second Great Awakening is more of a title given to this event by some of the some Baptist and by a, a lot of Methodist. It's also an event in history that historians uh, historians agree that did not come from the Puritan vein like the First Great Awakening did. It was coming from somewhere a whole a whole different method, a whole different approach. And some of the, the, the Reformed Puritan historians believe this was the beginning of like what we would call today the church fad movement, where whatever fad is popular, the church has to jump on. The church must be doing whatever is most popular. You see, what history has called the Second Great Awakening was not a theological revival like the First Great Awakening. It was not even a real to the core theocentric biblical teaching that was taking place during the second great awakening like it did with the first great awakening the second great awakening was all about emotion it was emotionalism the idea was hey christianity it's getting too stuffy and we don't like this stuffy type of christianity let's let's give them something that makes them feel different Let's change how it all feels. Let's, so, let, let, let's, let's appeal to the emotional side of things. But it lacked depth and richness and content. And some historians actually credit the Second Great Awakening as the launching point of many different cults, such as the Latter-day Saints. I don't really have an argument against them. There could be a lot of truth to that. Now, is that the exact reason why the Church of the Latter-day Saints started because of the Second Great Awakening? Hard to say. But the timing and the location and everything seems to indicate that this could be the case, that the Second Great Awakening was the event in American history that launched all the different cults that came out of the 1800s. Because we can appeal to people by emotion, not by truth. I have always argued that something evil and sinister was present, present in the American culture in the 1800s just simply on how things dramatically changed and the cults spiking at the exact same time. And at the exact same time, we began to witness the gospel disappear. The 1800s is not a point in history where we look back and we say, here are the solid preachers of this time. Here are the solid movements of this time. There's no real theological fondness of the 1800s at all. Maybe some of the hymns that came from there, but that's the best case scenario. It's not to say that there were not any faithful preachers, because there were, or that there were no faithful institutions, because there was. But not only did we begin to see something disappear, but on the rise were many false religions. 
If detectives are not allowed to believe in coincidences, then neither are Christians. Let's just say that. And this is why I say church history in America is quite odd, right here, especially right here in the 1800s. And after that, many things have changed. And this changed how church leadership took place. This changed church government. And the things that we hold near and dear now were really kind of like happening in the 1800s. It was beginning to start. A big part of it had to do with these, these circuit riders because a lot of times it was somebody acting solo. It was one guy coming through. And they would travel from destination to destination preaching. And sometimes a part of that was trying to establish a church wherever they were at. They were trying to not only come and preach, but establish a church while they were there. Because many of these places didn't have churches. And when you did that, you had a very, you had a very small area, you had very small communities, and uh, there was really only one person who was dedicated to doing the, the preaching. They, so the people would show up to church, and there would just be one guy there. And a lot of these small communities... And that created this dynamic that where you have just one pastor, a.k.a. one elder. And nobody else qualified to be a fellow elder. There was no need for a fellow elder because there was nobody else qualified there to be a fellow elder. But you had plenty of people within there who could play the role of deacon. And so it became like where you had this just this was one pastor, but then the deacons had to pick up a lot of the slack because there was there wasn't enough elders present. And so the deacons wound up taking a lot of control. There was a lot of needs in the community, a lot of physical needs that needed to be taken care of. And this is where we began to see, especially in Baptist churches, uh, uh, deacon governments, deacon ran churches. That the deacon board will govern the church. And then here we are today where we sit in our modern day churches and so many are confused about what ministry is and confused about what pastors are and confused about the role of deacons and, uh, and the role of the government within the church. And really, the matter is not very confusing. Now, we should be sympathetic to our brothers in history where they were in situations where they could not have a plurality of elders and where they were in situations where the, the pastor had to act alone and he was by himself and he had no choice but to have multiple deacons. And you have to understand in a lot of these places, they call it the Wild West for a reason. And it was very hard to be a pastor in the middle of the Wild West. And so, um, I mean, there, there, was, there was a lot of things going on there. It was not... Those specific guys who changed the church government, it was those who were little and being raised up in the church witnessing that who changed it. Because what happens is that the, the young ones go, this is church. They grow older. They wound up being the leaders of the church eventually. This is the way we've always done it. In their minds, that's, that's the way it's done. And so it was the next generation that started doing this. And each generation, boom, boom, boom. It gets worse and worse and worse. Today, deacon board ran churches tend to be churches that abuse their pastors now. This is a very common trend that we see with churches where the deacon board runs it. Then any other type of governing model in ministry, this is the one where we see the most abuse take place on pastors. And I've shared this in the past. I'll share it with you guys again. I'm a former pastor of mine serving at his church where it was it was deacon led. And he found out that his daughter, who was a teenager at the time, was raped within the ministry during a overnight church youth lockdown. Some people are familiar with this. Uh, uh, this is a, a popular thing that was done with churches. Some churches still do this, by the way. Um, this is where they bring the youth in, they have a slumber party inside of the church, they lock the doors, and within the church they have a slumber party inside. And so uh, that's what they did. They decided to have this big slumber party with inside of the church and lock the doors. What this specific ministry did is they invited teenagers who were not attending that church, who were not members of that church, they were within the community, but they, were, they weren't known people. And they invited them to come and be a part of this. And it was these teenagers that committed the act, and it was more than one boy, that did this to 
our pastor's daughter. When this pastor found out what happened to his daughter, he was angered, as you can imagine. I mean, you can, you can imagine all the feelings he felt. And he requested some time off to be with his family, to kind of collect himself. He was, I mean, you can only imagine. And he wasn't asking for like a couple days. He, he's like, I, 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 need, I need some time off. I need a sabbatical. I need to be with my kid. I, need to, I, I, need to, I just need to be there and I need to, I need to get myself in a spiritually good place because I'm not there right now with everything that's going on. And the deacons denied him this. After his family was going through great turmoil, the deacons denied him this. I mean, their pastor came to them and said, hey, you know what? I'm not in a very good place right now with everything that's happening. My sole purpose, my sole mission here, it's, it's hindered right now. And I need to focus on my family and get my family together before I can think about getting this church together. And, and, and then I could come back better. And the deacon board was like, nope. And I knew some of these deacons, by the way. This happened before I attended the church, but I knew some of these deacons and I know exactly how they think. I know their exact line of thinking. Business as usual. The business goes on. By the way, I, I, uh, I vowed to myself after hearing that story, I will never pastor a church that does such a thing. I will never approve an overnight church lockdown. Ever. I know another young pastor who served at a church in Aurora, Colorado. Deacon ran church. A uh, bunch of retired men were on the deacon board. Um, I think the youngest deacon was probably 82 years old. He was the youngest. He was the young whippersnapper on that team. And the deacons demanded that the pastor act a specific way towards the church when worship was happening. While, while they were coming in and gathering. They wanted the pastor to go and mingle along with everybody. They didn't like him speaking with his own wife and with his own kids. They didn't even like him around his family. And so they were being real passive aggressive about it at first. And he picked up on it, but he was ignoring it. And eventually the deacons came up to you, came up to him and they said, you know what? We've been laying down some clues and you've been ignoring it. Now we're going to flat out tell you. You better start loving all of these new people that walked in our doors more than you love your own family. That was the words, the choice of words they used. That evening he resigned. I mean, there was a lot going on with this ministry. There was so much more abuse he was taking. I sat and we met every week um, and he, he was just telling me new ways on how they were just abusing him and he wasn't sure how much longer he could take it. But the moment they told him that about his family, he goes, I resign. They wound up meeting with the state convention. The guy who was running the state convention told him, you've had four different pastors in the last 12 years. That's not good, by the way, guys. That's a lot of turnaround for pastors. Four different pastors within the 12 years. It can't be just that these pastors are no good. There's something going on here. Well, the issue is you gave power to men who should not have power. You gave these guys governing authority who should not have governing authority. I mean, he didn't do that specifically. He came into that situation like that. But that's the issue here. And so now we sit here today and churches have began to get away from deacon board leadership because they've been very destructive. And more and more churches are going towards a plurality of elders. But now the issue that is taking place in so many ministries is that they have taken the same attitude that these deacon board ran ministries have had, and they've adopted it into this plurality of elders. And the attitude is, this is a business and we will run it as such. How can we brand ourselves better? What are the things that we can do to get, our, our, get out there? How can we be more uh, financially stable? What are certain, it becomes real. It, it, it's not ministry talk anymore at this point. So we come to the point and a topic of our discussion, the government of the church. Who is in charge? Who is in charge when it comes to the government of the church? Well, if we're going to be a church that desires to be truly biblical 
and we shall desire this. And if we're going to be a church that want to honor God, and we shall desire that, and we want to honor God on how this church is to be governed, we must have the first things first. We must know the most important, the very first truth that we must affirm when it comes to who governs this church, that is Christ himself. Christ is the head of this church. Christ will always be the head of the church. If you want to know who's in charge of Ramsey Baptist Church, it is Christ. We will place no other governing model, anything that we can think of above Christ himself. He is our cornerstone. Upon this rock, I will build my church, are the words of our Lord. And we are a part of that church building. He is the cornerstone. He is the head of all that we do. Christ is the center of it all. We cannot talk about church government if we are not in submission to Christ and his lordship. I do not desire to go one inch further if we are not submitting to Christ and his lordship. You see, so many Christians around so many ministries around the world proudly proclaim that Christ is the Lord of lords and the king of kings until what? Until we talk about church government? Until we talk about our own salvation? Until we talk about government in general and the, and the responsibilities of the secular government, suddenly he's not the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Suddenly that has no weight. No, those words mean something. Those words are truth, whether our secular government recognizes it or not, or the church recognizes it or not. That is an, uh, an, ob uh, an objective truth. And it remains true. Christ is Lord over lords. He is king over kings. Every single one of them. They mean something. So the first in command is Jesus. We don't ever want to be a church that loses sight of that. That's what's happening. We have ministries that are losing sight of this. Our goal here as the followers of Christ, are to honor Christ with all that we do and with all that we have. And we will be working towards that. And we will be striving towards that. So again, the first in command is Jesus. And if we're going to be faithfully submitted to Christ, then we need to be faithfully submitted to all that he has instituted for his church. And so Christ has given his church structure. He has given organization to the church. And he is the one who has established what we call the governing model, what the governing model should be. So again, the first in command, Jesus. But what about when it comes to some of the other things that like scripture doesn't address? When it comes to the location of the local gathering, when it comes to uh, the type of carpet and the color of the carpet. Scripture does not give us any indication on what color our carpet should be or where uh, specifically we should be located. Well, this is something that God has always known about, about his people, about uh, when, when he was building his church. And so scripture has actually provided for us, God's word provides for us what, the, what should be the, the governing church model. And so within that church government, underneath the headship and lordship of Christ, who is in charge? The simple answer, the easiest answer is everyone. But there is separation of power here. And this is what we'll call it. We'll call it a separation of power. You see, in the pages of Scripture, there are a certain amount of authority that is given to the elders and the elders alone. But there's also a certain amount of authority that has been given to the congregation. In the briefest sense, the elders have the authority to teach the word of God. They have the authority to administer all the ordinances. Uh, the authority uh, overseers have is to call special meetings and to oversee the congregation and, and rule over the congregation in a spiritual and godly manner. 
Now, that phrase may rub people the wrong way to rule over the congregation. Like uh, it shouldn't be taken like a dictatorship because there is authority given to the congregation. The congregation that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the authority that the congregation has is they have the authority to appoint and dismiss elders. They have the authority to accept new members and be involved in discipline of members and perhaps even discharge members if needed. That is the authority that the congregation has. Again, we have stated in the past that we will talk about church discipline when Jesus talks about it. It's something I'm very tempted to talk about in our study of the church, but Jesus will talk about it in better detail when we get to that. And so we're going to hold off until we get to chapter 18. So those are, in a nutshell, the description of who has authority when it comes to the church. It's the elders and the church members, but they have separate types of authority. The authority that Christ gives elders is not for the purpose of running everything for the sake of running everything, but it's for the purpose of protecting the church and protecting the congregation. If you look at uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 3, Peter lets the church know that the purpose is not to lord over them, that the purpose of the elders is not to lord over them. They're not to lord over the congregation, but to watch over the congregation and be mindful of the congregation and to care for the spiritual well-being of the congregation. I mean, the first thing you must establish is that the elder of the church must be biblically qualified. That's something that the congregation has to be watching for. Is the elder of the church, the overseer of the church, biblically qualified? And we looked at that a little bit last week. If you're curious to know where those qualifications can be found, it's in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And you will find the qualifications of the elder. It's also where you will, you will find the qualifications for deacons. In verse 5, uh, we see that the elder is to manage his own household. If you want to know who he is as, as a leader, you need to look at how he manages his, whole, his own household. This has nothing to do with business, guys. This has absolutely nothing to do. The qualifications of the pastor are not how good are you at budgeting? How good are you at marketing? How good are you at delegating? It has nothing to do with that. You want to know if somebody's going to be an effective pastor? Look at their family and how they manage their family. How well does this elder manage his family? Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, left a note there to help the church for guidance when they are choosing their overseer. When they're choosing their elder. And if you want to know if the pastor that is being looked at is going to do well in managing the church in the biblical sense, then his family is the one that needs to be looked at. Now, again, we have very different ways today of defining the word manage. Very rarely do churches question, how is the family managed? Very rarely do churches monitor how the man is with his family before choosing him as an overseer. This happens very rarely. And even then, that can be tricky at times because there are plenty of people out there who are good at faking a family life. Very good. You want to know who's really good at faking a family life? Everybody. You want to know how I know? Because I'm on Facebook. And Facebook is the family life you want to show the world, but it's not the truth of your family life now, is it? It doesn't show all the nitty gritty. That'd be embarrassing if you did. I turn on the video. All right, me and the wife are arguing right now. I just want you all to get a glimpse on uh, this fight. Oh, she threw something. Um, she's mad that I'm recording. I mean, it just, that's never happened in my household, by the way, this, just so you guys know, but um, no, it's never happened. <laughs> it's never, ever happened. Um, uh, anyway, Facebook is kind of that place. It's, it's, it's only what you want people to see. It's like, I, I got this great family life. And then it's like three weeks later, it's like, hey, guys, getting divorced. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the deadbeat husband, he, he robbed me of everything and, and then said I couldn't read good on his way out. I don't know. You guys know how these things go. But um, there are so many congregations that, yeah, that, that are looking for this, but it, they can be deceived. It's easy to deceive is my point. 
But you have to be looking on how a man manages his family, more concerned with than how he manages the finances. I mean, that's a part of it because that's a part of managing. But we're talking about the difference of caring for his family and the difference between business tactic. I mean, they're more... The questions that get asked with pastors are like, what strategies do you have that it's effective for church growth? And it's like, we noticed your wife hates you, but what, what strategies do you have that is effective for church growth? Hey, we can't help but notice your, your, uh, your teenage son has been arrested like four times, but do you have strategies for effective growth? And it's like, yeah, I got all kinds of strategies. And they're going to ignore all the red flags. So the congregation has the authority to choose who their overseer is. It's a type of authority. And that's an authority that's given by the word of God. Again, Christ is the head of the church. He runs the show. So the congregation must choose an overseer based on what the word of God has to say. The word of God is the final authority. And so based on what the word of God has to say, that is how the congregation is to select their elder. According to the word of God, the elder must be the husband of one wife. I mean, let's just forget a second that scripture blatantly says that a female is not to hold a position of authority in the church. Let's just forget that the scriptures say that for a second. To be a qualified elder, you must be the husband of one wife. How does Pastor Susan... How is she the husband of one wife or Pastor Lisa or Pastor Lauren? How are they the husband of one wife? What we will do then is find creative ways to tiptoe around these verses. We will take our magical Sharpie and cross that out. And let's not look at it again. This is why we're failing with our churches because we're telling God, you know what? We know better than you. You gave us the structure. You gave us the command. You gave us your word as authority. But you know what? We're a bit smarter than you, God. And we'll take it from here. That's the attitude. No one's directly saying it, but that's the attitude. God designed the leadership of the church, the overseers to be ran by males. The office of elder, the office of pastor, is an office for men. It's not to say that women can't have any responsibilities in the ministry setting, but when it comes to this specific office and the government of the church, this is the way God has designed it. And it's not just that any man can do it. No, not any man can do it. It has to be a man that fulfills the qualifications as laid out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. You don't need an overbearing guy who has a very sinful way of looking at uh, 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 1 Timothy chapter 3 and thinks that he can dictate everything and everybody else fall into submission. That is not biblical leadership. This is why the word of God must be our authority in all things and the congregation must be in prayer and submission to God when selecting that overseer. It can't just be any man, and it will not be just any man. That's what churches are doing now. We'll just pick anybody. But it cannot be just any male. The church is under the authority to pick that person, and it's under the obligation to pick their overseer biblically. That is the authority of of the congregation. They have that authority. Now look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. This is an idea in a church government. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your soul as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this world would for this would be unprofitable for you. Now, this is a wonderful verse, a great verse to kind of describe what I'm talking about here. This relationship between the two authorities within the church, the church, the congregation has the authority to choose who their overseer is, to choose who their elder uh, is. They, they, and, and what they're choosing is the one that they will be submitting to for spiritual needs. 
And, and so they need to watch on how this elder behaves, how the pastor is going to behave, how this pastor is going to watch over their souls. And is he doing it with joy, not with a poor attitude? I mean, if the pastor was cranky all the time and he's saying like, man, you guys are dumb and you never learn. And I got to do talk to you guys this every single week. Man, I just hate ministering to you guys. That's neither good nor helpful. You don't want that guy ministering to you. Now, this verse really does hurt the whole church solo movement, by the way. That I do not need the church movement or I will even some of these 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 um, home church movements as well. Some of them are, um, are very unbiblical. Christians were never called to be self-sufficient. Never. Nor does their strength come from being self-sufficient. Our Lord provided a means of grace that is practiced uh, within the church that must be practiced by every believer. While I have no issue with churches growing out of the home or perhaps even starting in a home or even gathering in the home so long as they have the, the biblical governing model, some of these ministries, these, these, these launched ministries from a home, happen because people feel like that every church has gone to, a, gone to a state of apostate. There's no real church out there, and it's only left to themselves in order to launch the real true church. There are people out there who have this very attitude. So they, they launch a church never under the blessing of any sending church, never being, never being picked by any congregation whatsoever. Is one guy who decides he's going to gather some people and he'll grow it. And it's somebody who will lack accountability. It was somebody who hates accountability and has decided to create his own environment where he will never have to receive accountability. You see, because the elder is accountable to the congregation, the congregation has to hold the elder accountable. This goes in every direction. The congregation has to hold the congregation accountable. And so there are people out there who will create an environment of zero accountability They'll find every single thing they dislike about every single church they've hopped to. And they go like, well, that guy wore that tie in that pulpit that day. And that lady came and said this to me and this wound up happening. So I'm done. They're all they're all unbiblical. I know I'll launch my own church and I'll tell everybody I'm in charge. And that's the way it's going to be. It is that same type of individual who will abuse the relationship between the authority of the church and the authority of the congregation by telling the congregation, you have zero say. That's what they will do. That text also hurts everybody who says, I'm a better Christian away from the church than with the church. Who are the leaders you are submitting to for your spiritual care? Now, last week we looked at Acts chapter 6, uh, the choosing of the deacons. And if you remember, there was an issue that certain widows were uh, being treated unfairly when it came to the distribution of food. And so they went up to the elders and the elders were like, you know what, uh, we can't just be bombarded with these things all the time. All right. There has to be people that we need to choose who can take care of the physical needs of people. That way, the elders can focus on the ministry of word and prayer. Well, in that text that we looked at last week, the elders told the congregation Choose from among yourselves. The elders didn't go and say, we will choose for you. They said, choose from among yourselves. Men of reputable character. The congregation had the authority to choose who will be their deacons. But there's another section in Acts where we see the congregation choosing their elders. Look at Acts 14, verse 23. Talking to the church when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Right here we have a text and there's more to the story, but I'm just trying to make the point that we have a section of scripture where the church, the congregation appointed elders. They are the ones who got to choose and say who their elders were. So the church has the authority to choose who will be in leadership. And that's a big responsibility. They also have the authority to end the relationship with the elder as long as it's for biblical reasons. 
If I stand here and I begin to preach all kind of heretical things, but deny you guys to get rid of me for doing these things, I am not allowing you to exercise your biblical authority. The reason why the congregation has that kind of authority is for that very reason, is part of that very reason. If the pastor, if the elder has gone into rank heresy, the congregation is obligated to get that man out of the pulpit and find an elder who will be or orthodox. You don't sit and continue to receive heresy because he says he's in charge. It has to be for biblical reasons, though. You cannot say, hey, you know what? I just don't like this guy. He may, he, he's a faithful preacher in all that he does. But his voice, ugh, I don't want him no more. He just does things that twist my nerves. That would be an abuse of authority. And it would be unbiblical for a congregation to behave in such a way. The responsibility... The governing responsibility that both parties play are, are huge and must be, are, must be treated with respect and reverence. Understand that the position of the elders is for the care of, the, of, the, of, of your souls. It's for the care of the congregation. And so the congregation is submitting to them for that care of their spiritual needs, of their spiritual good. But the elder has accountability with the congregation and the congregation has accountability with each other. Now, all of this sounds very simple, and it should be very simple, but boy, is it never this simple because of one simple thing, one, one little issue we have in our lives, this little itty-bitty thing called sin that always robs us of our, uh, of, of, of our thinking, that robs us of our attitudes, makes us behave in ways we ought not to behave. And so what do we want to do? Well, we want to split over the color of the carpet. We want to split over the cosmetic things, the trivial things. I want to huff and puff because I don't like that one chair. I wanted the other chair. I'm going to get mad because the certain type of trim that we put up. I didn't want that trim. I didn't want walnut. I wanted oak. I don't know of a single ministry where somebody got upset over the most trivial things and they, they didn't display that, that like, where they, they, I don't know of a single ministry where this hasn't happened, but some of the most trivial things have taken place and there's always at least one person within a ministry at some point in time that acts out in their anger in the most childish ways rather than, than uh, uh, calling for reverence, showing the reverence. I don't know of a single ministry that hasn't experienced this, this attitude of, uh, you know what, I'll just up and leave because I didn't get my way. Let's see how they do without me. I didn't care for the color of, that, of the walls and how they were painted. Therefore, I'm going to show my grievance by uh, not showing up at all. And then, and then, then they'll understand how mad I am. I shared a while back how the church I was involved with, we were voting on for we were voting for a new worship leader. At the time, we were about 150, 200 members, and the entire congregation was there, and everyone voted in favor. And there was there was one nay, and that was me. That was the only one that was opposed to this one guy, and I was the only nay that spoke up. It did cause a little strife for me. It did, as it will in a ministry setting. But never did I have the attitude that, you know what, I'm the only one that made this decision. These people are clearly wrong. Therefore, I'm not going to be here anymore because I didn't get my way. As a matter of fact, I told my pastor, he came up to me. He was very concerned about my name. He was very worried. And he came up to me uh, and, and he, he wanted to know how come I wasn't in line with the rest of the congregation. And I had to let him know. I said, look, pastor. I'm submitting myself to the choice of the congregation and what you guys are going. I'm respecting their decision and I submit myself to their decision. 
And in that moment, I saw the relief come off my pastor. I, see, I mean, it was physical, the relief that came off of him. You want to know why? Because he was already used to people leaving over the smallest, dumbest things. And he was afraid in that moment that I was going to get mad and behave in the same way. Because it was that common. That when somebody didn't get their way, he was so used to it. Where even if the 99% of the congregation was for it, that 1% doesn't get his way. He demands change. He demands that the 99% submit to his will. And if they don't, then he's going to show his grievance in a specific way. By leaving, by showing attitude, by, by doing whatever he can. He will show his grievance in a certain way. And my pastor was afraid I was about to go that direction because it was that common. And he approached me. He talked to me because he was worried. And he was like, in his mind, here we go. Can't win them all, can't please everybody. You know, that's the, here, we're about to lose one because I can't please everyone. He was so used to be treated like Walmart rather than a pastor. He was so used to people treating the church like Walmart rather than the church where they say, you know what, I'll take my money and go elsewhere. Give me satisfaction or I'm gone. The whole attitude of, hey, you know what? You're not the only game in town, buddy. And when I wound up saying, no, I'm submitting myself to the leadership of the ministry and what the congregation has chosen, I just watched that relief just come right off of him. It would be beyond childish of me to behave in such a way. I'm not getting my way, so I'm going to huff and puff and stomp out of here. Who does that? Children and liberals do that. Okay, I didn't have to add that last part in there, but I did. Even though I was the minority in that, and I did not agree with the decision, I still submitted myself because I trusted in that congregation. And I could have huffed and puffed and walked out, but that is not a biblical attitude. That is not the behavior of a Christian. And it shall not be tolerated. Even when we disagree, we submit ourselves to the authority of the elders and to the congregation in their respective roles. I can't come to you guys and say, hey, you know what? I met, I met somebody today, and, and he, he's an unemployed pastor. And guess what? He's now your associate pastor. And you're going to pay him this salary. And it's a done deal. I, I'm just bringing it on you guys, but now this is a done deal. You don't have a say in the matter. Go ahead. You know what? Give him a sign-on bonus while you're at it. I can't do that. I would be violating my position in that case. I can't come up and tell you who's going to pastor you. But we've gotten away from this, this model of governments. The elders taking care of what the spiritual things are, the good of the ministry, the congregation being diligent in choosing who is going to oversee them, being diligent with their fellow congregants. But it is our responsibility to come back to this. It is our obligation as the people of God to come back to this. Why? Why? Because Christ is the head of this church. And this is the way he has designed it. This is the way he has instituted it. So we will show respect and reverence to this. This is the proper mode of worship. Now, some people find the government of a church to be a very boring topic. The more exciting stuff's going to come next week when we start talking about our purpose as a church. And that's really where we kind of have the rubber meets the road. We're kind of getting into the, the, to the teachings of what we should be like, what the church is. We covered that. What the government is. Now we're going to look, look at what's our calling. What are our duties? What are we supposed to be doing here? But for now, before we can even begin thinking about uh, our calling and who we are as a church, we must be focused on who is in charge. Christ is in charge of our church. We will not have it any other way. 
and we will be in submission to his commands and to his word and his word will be the final authority of all that we do. This is a non-negotiable for the church. If we depart from that, we are no longer a church. We're just a country club. We're just a gathering of people who like to get together and hear ourselves talk. But what we are doing is we're submitting ourselves to Christ, his word, and his organization. We should be greatly ashamed if we sit there and say, you know what, Lord? We can do it better than the way you designed it. And we have done this in our American culture. You know what, Lord? I know of a better way that you must not have thought of. How prideful. I mean, we don't really say it that way, but it's happening. And so when it comes to the government of the church, Christ is the head. But we have the governing body of the elders. A plurality of elders is the way it should be. And they care for the spiritual care of the church. They decide of many of the spiritual things of the church. But the congregation has an obligation as well and a, a role to play and a responsibility. They must choose the right overseers. Because they are ultimately choosing the ones that they're going to be trusting for the spiritual care. They must be there for church discipline. That's a, that's a role for the church. And there comes a time where you must end church membership with somebody. And that is the role for the church. So who governs this under the lordship of Christ? A little bit of everyone. But you have a specific role to play. And we are not to violate those boundaries. Otherwise, we are truly not serving Christ as the head of our church. Let's pray. Well, Father God, I know that um, so many local gatherings have distorted and perverted what you have created, Lord. But Father, I pray that they, they, they come back to you, Lord. I pray that we are all repenting of, of our attitudes and, and of our ways, Lord. And Lord, that we are approaching you with a sincere heart, wanting to serve you wholeheartedly. And so, Lord, I pray that you always bring us great conviction to the truth of your word. And I pray that we are always submitting to the truth of your word. That way we can say, thus saith the Lord. And glorify you for being the one who has said it. Father, I pray that the truth is written on our hearts about how you have called your gathering and the way that you have organized your gathering and the way that you will have your gathering managed. May we desire it biblically and seek it biblically every day of our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.